The Gospel reading today is Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, and we invite you to join us in reading together. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you may god bless to our hearts this reading from god's holy word Amen.
Will you join with me in prayer? Loving and gracious God, Creator God, we come to you today, first of all, reminding ourselves that you are our Creator and trying to get a little piece of understanding of what that really means. We pray, dear God, that in our own personal and daily lives, we can, in fact, treat other people with love, that we can, in fact, be Jesus Christ in the lives of our neighbors and friends, perhaps even in the lives of those whom we do not treat as neighbors and friends. We thank you that you have given us that responsibility. We thank you that you have given us those choices and we pray that we might honor you in the things that we say and do. God, we pray now for those who are in special need of your love, in special need perhaps of your healing power because of injury to body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those whose lives are torn by poverty or perhaps even by a physical fighting war. We pray for those people whose decisions influence the lives of other people. We ask that you might grant them the wisdom and the courage to find peace. God, we make that same prayer for ourselves as well. Help us not to hide behind thinking that maybe we're not very important. Help us recognize that we too touch and influence the lives of other people. And so we make the same prayer for ourselves as we make for leaders of nations. We ask that your wisdom and courage might guide everything that we do, that we might be instruments by which you touch the lives of other people. Now, God, we ask that you would hear us as we join together and pray together the prayer that Jesus prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven how would be thy name? In our scriptures today, we continue our reading from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it reads, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery 
and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This has been the word of God. Brothers and sisters, come back to that very place and listen as Jesus brings hope and righteousness to the people who mistrusted his message. Isn't this the message that all of us need now? How might we follow Jesus more by modeling the practical and spiritual direction he applied on that mountain? practical spiritual direction for all of us from many diverse ethical and religious backgrounds. Will you come with me to the Sea of Galilee where Jesus is beginning his ministry, gathering many followers, including several fishermen, such as Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, also the Zebedee brothers James and John who have decided to ditch their nets and the business of repairing them for a new life as associates of Jesus. As Jesus is moving around the sea, the people have become so impressed with him because he has enormous gifts for healing. And so he's attracting folks with all kinds of illnesses, large crowds of people from the Galilee and surrounding areas of the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and even beyond the Jordan River. Jesus, on seeing all the people who were gathering, went up on a mountain, sat down, and the followers surrounded him. Jesus was laying out his radical message, hoping it would be irresistible to many people who were seeking to follow the path of God, a path that would improve their lives, a path out of oppression and poverty into the fullness of humanity. Here is what he said as he totally captivated them with his persuasive words. Happy are people who are hopeless because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve because they will be made glad. 
happy are people who are humble because they will inherit the earth. Happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be fed until they are full. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. Happy are people who have pure hearts because they will see God. Happy are people who make peace because they will be called God's children. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you, all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven in the same way People harassed the prophets who came before you. Is it possible that all of this can happen? Can we open our hearts and minds to let in the kingdom of God, the essence of God's presence in the universe? Can we be the salt of the earth, moving people to do good things? The human essence of goodness. On the mountaintop, Jesus told his followers that they are the light of the world. That means that when a follower of Jesus accepted the message Jesus was offering, he or she was becoming examples to others to further the living ideas of Jesus. All of Jesus' ideas expressed on the mountain will become a sensible foundation of a moral tradition for everyone. How awesome it is that Jesus would cover so much in his teaching. Remember how he urged the people to keep the law and the words of the prophets, not setting aside the ages of Judaism, but allowing a possibility for a more tolerant and open interpretation and practice, but respecting the tradition. Comments Jesus made were the nuances and the impacts of very severe acts. Jesus assured his flock that murder is terrible, but at the same time let the followers in on a novel idea that we often kill by harming our brothers and sisters spiritually through unkindness. On the mountain, Jesus asks us to make up, to reconcile by coming together before an issue becomes irrevocable and intolerable. One such example is marital issues. It is so hard to let go when people do hurtful things to us or speak in insulting terms. But Jesus' take is so simple. Quote, you have heard that it was said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. No, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you. Just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. We all know how hard it is to forgive. Forgiveness will without doubt be the salvation of the world. How much wisdom Jesus is sharing on this mountaintop in this focused teaching time at the Sea of Galilee. He is touching on so many areas of life that need purposeful attention. If only the new recruits of Jesus would want to understand the message and do the work of moral application to internalize what Jesus was saying and demonstrate how it can work in the community. Not a static conversation. Jesus is providing guidance in personal relationships, 
as well as one's relationship to the traditional religious establishment. Doesn't the Sermon on the Mount incorporate universal values for forgiveness and reconciliation for people of many backgrounds who may be sitting down with Jesus on the mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee? May we pray for unity among all who live in the troubled lands. Amen. As we gather around the table today, maybe we're looking at other folks who are gathering with us or at least imagining people in every time and at every place that are coming to this table in the eternal now. Each of them struggling with their faith, trying to live the way that God has called them to live. And looking at these passages that we've just read and thinking, wow, that's, that's hard. Jesus has ratcheted up the standard even higher. And we wonder, do we measure up? As we come to the table, we're reminded of the other standard that Jesus holds up, which is the standard of grace. We know that none of us is righteous in our own standing. But Christ has given us His righteousness that we can stand in God's presence. And as we think about and remember His death for us, remember also that He has done that so that every single one of you, each and every one of us, is welcome at this table and welcome in the presence of God. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, for the gift of his sacrifice, for making things right so that we can boldly come into your presence knowing that we don't stand by ourselves, but we stand in the righteousness of Jesus. We thank you that we can remember Christ who paid the price so that we might be made whole. We pray that we would not stand in the way of anyone who would come, of any and all, because all are welcome here. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And so we remember on the night that Jesus himself was betrayed, as he looked around the table at these people, these Folks who each had their failures, each had their concerns, and none of them was exactly righteous. All friends, all welcome. He took the bread and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Eat this and remember me. And in the same way afterwards, he took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. And so the table is set and the host is welcoming with open arms. Come, join the feast.
your friends. Let us go today in peace to love and to serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.